Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for, I guess this is a special edition of the show. There's no review, there's no interview. I'm not recapping uh, a special event or anything like that, but it is a special. So um, I'm calling this kind of like, what did, I, what did I do Q1 2020? Basically it's about the advanced sommelier exam. But let's just kind of go over a few things. I already recorded, actually this is the second time I've recorded this episode. First time was really long probably said some things I don't need to say. Nothing was bad. It just needed to like maybe re-edit some of that stuff. And I figured I'd just redo it. Uh, this is actually one of the wines I reviewed. I did like nine wines, uh, spirit. I'm not gonna tell you which wine this is, but I'm gonna just tell you, basically all the wines I reviewed you're gonna see over the next like two months are really good. This one especially was, it was really good. Anyway, um, and there's one of my episodes where I, I didn't turn this on by accident. That sucked. So it, it's the iPhone audio. It won't be the worst audio, but it'll be okay, I guess. All right, so let's kind of get through this. So what did I do in Q1 2020? Um, so if you watch my episodes in January and February, well, you already kind of know what I did, especially like any type of conferences I went to, which were in January. So I'm not going to rehash that. But in February, mid-February, I went to the Texom International Wine Awards SOM Retreat. So I did TIWA. It's called TIWA SOM Retreat, but TIWA. I volunteered a couple years, a few years ago for the uh, operation of it. So like the back behind the scenes stuff where you're getting wine set up, you're making sure that the, the wines are set properly, and all that kind of stuff, polishing glassware, all that, all that cool stuff. I got to sit in also with some of the judges to see how they did stuff. In this case, it was a SOM retreat, and it was a great experience. I'd seen that there's something was going on the last time I did it, and was really curious how to get in there. It was a nomination process. Now they really opened it up, so it was an application process. So you've got master, Masters of Wine, you have Master Sommeliers, you have journalists, and they're all there for mentorship. This is not something to help you pass an exam. This is really to help you in your career, whether it's um, being on the floor, being in distribution, being in retail, not as much for the journalism, journalism side, but I mean, me being a journalist, it was also helpful for me. And some of us have blogs, so it can be helpful for writing stuff. I don't do a lot of writing, but I do a lot of speaking. So it can also help with that. So I was really happy they opened up this is an application process because that allowed me to really be part of it without having to worry about like having working working for the right people. I know everybody up there, so it's not a matter of knowing people. It's being nominated and not being with the right people to not be nominated if you're not working with them on a daily basis. Um, so the whole experience is like you know sharing of ideas. We would do like scenarios. Sometimes you're like round table discussions. Sometimes we're like at a table, kind of somewhat mock exam, but the, the questions and the scenarios where you have a bunch of people in the same room, like all of us, and we're all, be, we're all there to watch what the person at the table's doing and also give them help if necessary. And so it was a different scenario for each person. So some of these were like something you would find on the floor as a psalm. Some of it was maybe in a retail set, setting, maybe questions that were more related to distribution. So it wasn't just a SOM thing necessarily. Um, and then you, we also talked about tasting. We did some tasting exercises. Uh, we had some theoretical things and it was just great. You were interacting with some of the best people in the business, whether they were people at my level or people that are like, um, or people that are like just got their certified. So they haven't even really done too much work towards the advanced or you're with masters and just like badass people. So 
Then after that, and that was like about three weeks before the advanced exam. So then after that, the advanced exam. So first off, yeah, I'm going to tell you about it, but I'm not going to really tell you about it. I'm not going to give you the details. I'm going to give you the big overview. And why am I going to give you details? Well, number one, the court really doesn't want us to really publicly <clears throat> go through the minutia of the test. <clears throat> Part of that is to keep the integrity of the test, but really, I could sit there if I could remember them all. If I sat there and gave you, well, question number one was this, question number 35 was this, in my scenario, I got asked to do this, and I, this was what the specific scenario was, and you know, I think wine number four was this. It might, it's not gonna help you. It's not even gonna help me necessarily to have the correct answer for some of these things because I may never have that on an exam again, especially on the advanced side. They have thousands of questions. They have multiple scenarios they can run and variations on those scenarios. So me telling you the details isn't really gonna matter. Just make sure you know your stuff. All right, so qualifications, how do you get this? So you have to pass the certified sommelier exam. That makes sense. Uh, there's a course you need to take. Now they started this a few years ago and I took the course in 2016. I'll have a link below to my recap of that course. Again, I was the same thing. I didn't give you super details, just kind of give you the overview. Uh, then you also take a knowledge assessment. This is done sometime in November or December. You have like about a three-ish week period of time to sign up. In the past, it was just online. So you could do it at home, do it at work, whatever. And that was fine, but now what they've done is you go to a testing center and you take it there. So it's proctored, it's monitored. You know, you don't, you're not, you're not gonna have like other people taking the test for you or someone over your shoulder giving you answers or you're looking stuff up. And that's fine. Um, the first two years I took it, I struggled with it. Hey, I, I did look some stuff up. But you know what that does? It slows you down. You don't finish the test. This time I finished the test. I had like, I don't know, like 20 some odd minutes left. I had marked off some questions to go back and review. I went back and reviewed some of them. A few of them I put an answer down or changed an answer. And after all said and done, I figured out that I had somewhere between 80 and 85% of the questions correct. 100 questions, so I got between 80 and 85 questions correct. But that didn't mean I got an 85 or an 80 or 82%. You're ranked among everybody, and that's how they determine who gets to go. And I was in the 67th percentile. That was actually plenty good enough. I'm sure every year the, the threshold or the, the minimum percentile is different. <clears throat> and they tell you what it was. I'm not going to tell you what it is now because, again, it's not relevant because it may be different next year or this year, I guess. So the 67th percentile was plenty fine, and I, you know, got in. So um, my first choice was actually to do it in July, which was in Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah, I know, like you wanna to go to Phoenix in the summer, right? But it's a dry heat. Anyway, um, actually I would have loved to have gone to Phoenix. And my second choice was March, this past March in Portland. I felt that July I would have been way more prepared and I still think I would have been way more prepared. Whereas March, I was like, yeah, it's a little touch and go, but if I really work my butt off, I probably could be ready. So, um, but given the whole coronavirus thing, the COVID-19, I'm glad I got March because not that the court has said anything, but due to the fact that a lot of stuff that's scheduled for the summertime, whether it's June, July, or even August, not quite the August stuff yet, but June and July is being postponed and or canceled. Um, you don't know. There might be a chance that they may not have the advanced exam of the summer or they push it back a couple months type of thing, which honestly would be helpful for pre preparation. Um, so, so, you know, I didn't, I didn't get the result I wanted, which was to pass. Unfortunately, I did not pass. But, you know, I'm happy I went through it. And I was actually probably one of the most upbeat people there for not even passing. There were a lot of people that were devastated. And some of these people were first-time takers. So the pass rate of the exam is somewhere between 30 and 40% and 40% passed this time. So kind of the upper end of things. The majority of the people were taking it for at least the second time. At least 50%, if not more, of the people that were taking it, of the 64 who were there, there were probably 75 who were invited. And I'll get to what happened. Uh, but 64 were there, 25 people passed. 
that's normal. And I knew that going into it, but seeing kind of on day three and we're all together, it's the only time all of us were together and they said, how many people have taken it before? And there was a ton of people raised their hand. So, I mean, you're in good stead, Steed, whatever it is, that if you didn't pass the first time, it's okay. Most of the people who did pass were not first timers. All right, so um, so let's see here. Anyway, so with the whole um, uh, COVID-19 thing, the, the court, like the week before, was like, hey, we get there's a lot of concern. There's a lot of travel plans being changed, a lot of you know issues, people not being able to travel or whatever. And just people just being concerned about going into a hot spot, which Oregon wasn't quite a hot spot, but it was between two big hot spots. Think Skill and Charybdis, if you know your Greek mythology. So lots of concern. They said, look, if you don't want to show up, we get it, or you can't, or maybe you have COVID-19, we will let you drop out and you will get a full refund and we'll give you a guaranteed spot in March next year in Portland. And they already gave us the date. So I know it's March 8th is the, it's March 8th through 8th, 8th, 9th, 8th through 10th. This year was 9th through the 11th. Um, so that was cool. And I was like, you know what? I'm still going to do it because I felt I had a decent chance of passing. Obviously I didn't, but that's okay. All right, so the details, or I said I can't give you the details, but here's the overview. There's three sections to the exam. Same thing as actually certified, there's three sections. There's a theory portion, there's a service portion, and a tasting portion. But with the advanced... It's a little more complicated or a little bit more in depth, a lot more in depth actually. Uh, days one and two are, um, so day one is service, day two is tasting. And both those days you have uh, holding rooms or sequestering rooms. This is, as far as I know, somewhat new, maybe in the last two-ish years, probably related to something that happened a few years ago. I'll let you look it up uh, on the master exam. But it's really done to prevent any communication between candidates so if I had, say, day one, I had an early service time, or maybe I didn't have an early service time, and my buddy did, and he went through the whole service, he goes, hey, Mark, this is what the services scenario was like, and they're going to ask you these questions, they're going to ask you to do this, that, and the other. That gives me an advantage. It's not a competition, but it does give me an unfair advantage that I might know something ahead of time about the test specifically. Same thing with the tasting portion. You know, the person say, hey, I think these were the wines. I'm almost positive. And say they were like, or say it was me. And say we're like a badass taster. And you, you always were nailing the, the tastings. And like, you know, Joe says, wine number one is this. Wine number two is this, blah, blah, blah. And then I go in or I tell that person and they go in and they nail it. And maybe I didn't nail it, but I got pretty close. So it's to keep the integrity of things going on. And I get it. Because of this. Um, when you are in these rooms, you cannot have a watch, you cannot have a laptop, you can't have a tablet, you can't have a phone. Um, you can't really have anything electronic. So I wouldn't even like try to bring in like an iPod like shuffle, you know, that has no communication to the outside world. I wouldn't even bother bringing that. I didn't. I thought about doing something like that, but I was like, nah. But what they do is they'll have like games and activities so that it kind of helps pass the time. Day one, there's some snacks, not like actual lunch lunch, because there's two shifts. You have a morning shift and a p.m. shift, um, or an afternoon shift. So ideally, try to eat lunch before if you're on the afternoon shift, um, because you you report right around noonish. So try to eat something if you can. If not, they'll have snacks there, and that's what I did. I just kind of snacked, as I had like a late call time for my service. And then um, the second day is your, whenever you do your tasting, you report for tasting and then you you have to go to the holding room till the end of the day. So if you have a nine o'clock tasting appointment, you're there all day. So our noonish or so, they have like sandwiches and you know, like actually more like real food there. And then the beer comes out much later in the afternoon to help you relax. So they don't want you to get all like loopy, you know, like at 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, but like on the, on the first day, everyone who's, so everyone who's done on the first day in the morning, when they finish with the morning people, they get to go and they're done with the rest of the day. Whereas the afternoon people are already gathered ahead of time. So there's no way to communicate. And then all the AM people get to do whatever they want to do the rest of the day. And then the P, the afternoon people, 
go into the sequester room and then when you're done with your service portion you're done for the day so if you got lucky and had like say a one o'clock or a 12 45 uh, call time for service you, were, you had the whole afternoon to yourself I had a 355 on day one and I had a 1245 for tasting on day two so you know hey it wasn't it could have been worse I knew people that had like morning and morning but the morning on the day one is not that bad um, let's see here so this is a big reason to stay in the host hotel because otherwise if you have your phone or like any other, anything else you got to leave it in your car if you drove to the hotel, if you didn't have a car, then you have to leave it in your in the hotel you're staying at. So I'm glad I stay at the host hotel. Oh, one other thing, you can bring a book. You can't bring any study materials. We can bring like say like a fiction book or a nonfiction book or whatever. Just it can't be related to wine. So if you want to read, you can do that. And a couple of people had books, but honestly, most of us just kind of sat around and chit chatted. We weren't allowed to talk about the exam. We weren't like to talk about any controversial subjects, so which is fine. So uh, yeah. Anyway, um, let's see here. So day one service. Again, there's a whole bunch of different scenarios. So what does happen is they call you together in groups. Um, groups around five or six people in two different groups. My group actually was just me and one other guy. We were the last to go, but you all will be in the same room at the same time. They want to see how you interact. And this is nothing secret, okay? Um, but you'll get 15 minutes. They'll give you some information about, about the scenario. You'll be able to kind of review everything. So when you go in, you've got an idea of the type of scenario you're in and what you might be doing. Uh, you can take notes if you want. I did. I should have used a different idea of what I was doing. But now I know what to do next. But basically, just be smart with the information you're given. You're given effectively all the answers to the test. Honestly, well, not all the answers, but you're given the majority of the answers of what they're going to ask you. So pay attention and go in and they'll, you know, ask you stuff. You'll have two different tables. You have a sparkling table, a canting table. Um, there'll be a cocktail you'll have to make and there was beer service. So um, you just have to be comfortable in all aspects because that's what a psalm is supposed to do. Again, this is nothing secretive. This is actually all out there that, you know, if you pay attention you'll see that this is all the type of stuff you have to do and um you know when i got done with it i was like i think i did okay like i knew i made a mistake here there everywhere i remember here and there but i was like man i, I might have passed but unfortunately i didn't i passed one of the tables and not the other um so anyway but i can say that being in the scenario i was way more relaxed then I've been in the past doing this in front of masters. And a lot of that is because my tasting group does this every Monday. We have a tasting group and then about once a month we practice service. Now we will modify how we practice service, at least when I host it, but I know we will modify the way we do service. But I mean, it's still relevant how we do it, but there's a better way for us to approach service. Day two, tasting. Standard setup for advance. It's three, uh, six wines. You have three whites, three reds, 25 minutes. You have three masters uh, in front of you. you. One's a timekeeper, but all three are writing down notes. Uh, they'll give you a halfway, a five minute, a two minute warning uh, as best as possible. Like they're not going to like, if you're in the middle of saying something, they're not going to be precisely at you're at halfway or you're at five minutes left or two minutes left, right? They'll, they'll give you a little bit of leeway. I actually finished in 22 minutes, which was my goal. And that allowed me to kind of sit back, relax. I went through all the wines again. I did change one final call, but my initial, it was still part of my initial. I know if, if, if you take these tests or do these tastings, you'll understand what I mean. You know, my initial, it was everything was still in the initial. I just changed the region for my final, but everything else was still the same from the, from the final I had. I just changed region. Um... But, you know, uh, the rest of the wines, I didn't change anything. Anyway, again, just like service, the most relaxed I've ever been doing a tasting in front of masters. So Tiwa kind of helped me with that because I had two tasting sessions. One was a one-on-one, -on -one, and we did two different tasting exercises. And then the other one was a group tasting exercise, and I actually got to do two wines, whereas the other two guys only got to do, or three guys only got to do one wine. And uh, it was a great place to fail. That's where you want to fail, right? Get some great feedback. And I did get some great feedback. Unfortunately, 
while I did listen to it and I tried to apply that feedback, I did apply a lot of that feedback. Some of the stuff I didn't quite do, basically I didn't show enough of my work. Remember in school where they're like, if you get the final answer, that's great, but you don't get full credit for the question. That's what tasting's like, okay? Again, nothing secretive about this. Day three's theory. Uh, first of all, first days one and two is about a half hour, right? You get 25 minutes for tasting, and then service takes about 20 to 30 minutes total to do. And then depending on your sequestering situation, you've got the rest of the day, right? Tasting, obviously, if you have a late tasting, you don't have to do anything for a long time. You can sit in your room and then you show up to where you're supposed to gather and then they call you and then you go to the sequestering room. Um, for day one, you know, depending on whether you're an AM or a PM, you know, uh, you, you, uh, you, when you're done with your service section, you go back to the sequestering room for maybe a short period of time, maybe a long period of time. If you're the last group of the morning group, when you're done with service, you're done. And on the PM side, when you're done with service, you're done, right? Um, day three theory, it's two main parts. And this is about a three hour thing. As you meet around nine o'clock in the morning, you're done around noon. It's two main parts. You have a business of sommeliers, and then the other part is divided into multiple choice and uh, fill in the blank. Uh, the business side, um, I did really well overall. Matter of fact, I almost passed it, but I hosed. There's a tasting portion. I won't go through the details of the tasting portion is, but it's there's a tasting portion, and a lot of the questions in that section are dependent on correctly identifying the beverages. I mean beverages, and not necessarily wine. The beverages that are there. Uh, again, this could change from from exam to exam within a year, from year to year. So that's why I'm not going to tell you what I thought I had. I mean, I know the category I have, and I'm not going to tell you like, well, well, beverage number one was this. It doesn't matter. Um, the multiple choice was okay. Um, I was pretty sure I had a minimum of 60% of of those correct. But when I hit the fill in the blank, man, I I was way out of my element. And, you know, <clears throat> here's the thing. The knowledge assessment, I did really well on. And this is not an excuse. It's not a blaming anything. But I may have had the right questions on the knowledge assessment. And I, I mean, I, I pretty much did really well. And then I I didn't, like, necessarily pull take the foot off the gas on studying the theoretical stuff. But if I had continued with the same intensity, I might have done much better on theory. So that's that's what happened. I mean, I didn't, they don't give you your score, but I walked out of that room going, there's no way I passed theory, which means I didn't pass the exam. You have to pass all three. You have to get at least a 60% in all three, okay? Um, and since you were done around noon, I had about six hours to kind of like, well, how do I think I did? Because at 6.15-ish, we start the feedback sessions, about 15 minutes at, at most. And so for like six hours, I was like, well, what am I gonna do? Well, I had lunch, went back to my room, watched a couple movies, took a nap, you know, had plenty of time to like self-evaluate where, where I felt I did, how I did on the, on the um, theory portion for the whole, the whole three hours, and I, it didn't take long for me to go, there's no way I passed. And, but I was like, but I probably passed the other two. I didn't, but that's okay. You know, I walked into, into the feedback. Um, so when you do the feedback, you'll have a master has, that has been with you for at least day one and or day two. Mine was with me for days one and two. And I was totally relaxed because, well, I already had figured out I hadn't passed. I wasn't like nervous or like, ooh, did I pass or not? And leaving the room after knowing I didn't pass for sure was relieving and I wasn't like upset. I was cool about it. I was all smiles, you know, I was thankful. I mean, I was probably one of the unusual people that walks out like I've been smiling and I leave smiling and I didn't pass. There were definitely people who were devastated. And some of these people were like the first time taking it. I'm like, dude, really? I get it. It's expensive. There's a lot of pressure on you. There is. I mean, maybe where I work, there isn't as much pressure as maybe if I was still back on the floor in a restaurant. But there's a lot of pressure for you to pass. I know someone who did pass his first time. Someone used to be in our tasting group, moved to a different state. And he was saying that he had a lot of pressure from his, from his higher ups. 
and they were like really, really like trying to work with him to pass the exam. And he passed, which is awesome. I'm, I'm so happy for him. But yeah, it's definitely a lot of pressure. And granted, people who did pass, a lot of tears of just relief. Especially if some of these people had taken it two, three, four. There was a lady who took it four times. It was her fourth time she passed it. So it's, it's not an easy test. All right, so um, I do have a... They, they offer you to be able to talk with the education director and that is uh i'm sorry exam director not education exam director that's shane bjornholm and he's a badass by the way i love this dude and so i have a phone call with him in a couple days a 15 minute phone call he'll give me some more feedback again he's not going to say the answer to question five is this but he'll probably give you some more targeted feedback and while i do have a plan of attack of what I want to study and how I want to study between now and next March. His feedback will probably be instrumental in finalizing exactly how I'm going to do my studying. And then right after that, I'm going to start studying. So what does that mean? The beard is going to come back. Oh, you probably didn't see the beard. There was maybe a beard during cocktail conference video because I had, I wasn't, I wasn't shaving around that time. Um, pretty sure I, yeah, I stopped shaving. I stopped shaving at that point. It was like, I, I hadn't shaved like a week, so it wasn't that much. But yeah, we'll have the epic beard. You'll, you'll see that. You won't see that really till June, I guess, honestly. Unless you watch some other stuff. I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, so yeah, but since then, I've been watching movies, playing some video games, watching TV shows. Like, things I'm trying to catch up on. Just relaxing. Um, but yeah, so like I said, the study... The studying officially will start earlier than planned, but I won't be like all hardcore lockdown like I was like the last three or four months before the exam because I'll, I'll still be able to enjoy th some things, but when I get closer to the exam, it'll be a total lockdown like I did this last time. All right, so um, this is a good time to kind of talk about this. I just want to say that I'm really thankful for the kind of job that I have. I'm still in the industry, but my job not my job, but the, the part of the industry I'm in is considered essential. So while there is definitely stress involved because I am in a public facing environment or position, so I am dealing with the public, um, I have a job and I don't have to worry about like how am I going to pay my bills or worrying about some type of congressional like bailout for myself and having to worry about health insurance and what, you know, whatever. I mean, it, it's scary, man. And all I got to say is um, I feel for all of you guys that are, whether you're in the hospitality industry or some other industry that you got laid off and you're, and you're watching my show for some reason, um, man, you know, I can't do much for you on a financial end. I can just only give you emotional support. But, I mean, I, I feel it. You know, and, and not in this kind of situation, but I've been there with no job. Hey, I didn't have a job for the first six weeks of last year. I was luckily I had enough savings to, to deal with that. But yeah, um, I, I went through at least something like that, but I didn't have the specter of a virus over my head either. <laughs> you know, I was like, I'm going to get a job, no problem. You know, it took a while, but I got a good job. So yeah, but I can say that... Uh, while I'm at work, I am as careful as possible, you know, trying to make that social distancing thing, washing my hands, sanitizing my hands. The problem is I touch my face all the time. It's kind of funny I haven't touched my face, I think, more than like once during this like 28 minutes. Um, but yeah, anyway, I try to do everything I'm supposed to do. And uh, I'm just again, grateful that I have a job. Uh, so what's going on? Oh, and then when I'm off, my days off, I really haven't gone anywhere. I did do one thing. I did, I'm working on a little project, like a short film for a contest, which may or may not even be, may not ever happen. But uh, I may have to go back out and redo it, which again is not the right thing to do, but I do have a press pass and I did not interact really with anybody except for like a very short period of time at my actual job because I needed to uh, get some wipes, honestly. So yeah. Anyway, that's, that's neither here nor there. I may not even be in the video, the final video. All right, so rest of the year. 
So uh, next week, I will be starting behind the scenes. So this week, I'll be recording a bunch of behind the scenes stuff. It's going to be things like, you know, a review of this Zoom H1 uh, audio recorder or tips on how to do things. Like I've got my green screen behind me. Actually, I had to change. One of the things about doing this video today versus last night is I realized that I, I when I use the phone, the iPhone 11 Pro has a much wider field of view than the camcorder does. So if I put the green screen where it used to go, <laughs> you the, the camera sees beyond the green screen. And, uh, and then if I crop it or I have to zoom in and then things, then you know, like wine bottles, then wine bottles, you know, you don't see the full, you know, you, like the, you only see like that part of the wine bottle because the phone's too close. And so I just adjusted stuff. So this should be good. I don't have to do any zooming or cropping. I tested it where the bottles, if I had a bottle, this is an eventual, it's one of my, one of the bottles like here, I mean, I don't have to zoom anything and the, and the bottle can be this far up and you can see the full label. So yeah. Anyway, um, so yeah, behind the scenes, so it's gonna be things like that, you know, tips, tricks, tutorials, reviews, you know, using using your uh, phone as your camera, uh, getting reasonably priced lights, not having to spend $2,000 on a camera, uh, spending less than 100 bucks on an audio recorder if you wanna do that, you know, um, using certain websites to help you with social media. Uh, if you're gonna host a podcast for video, options you have. Things like that. I've got 11, almost 11 years of experience doing this and I've used a ton of different equipment and I've traveled and I have definitely a lot of knowledge up here that I wanna to give to people who, especially at this point, and I'd already planned to do this before the whole coronavirus thing, but especially now where people are trying to be creative with their time, um, I think I can contribute to that and not be one of these like major photography guys that are like telling you, yeah, go and buy the thousand dollar camera that the camera body and yeah, you know, you can get by with the four hundred dollar lens. What? Granted, what I'm using is about that expensive, but it's also like a payment plan. It's also and it's it's I'm a little bit hypocritical because that's actually not my phone. This is my phone, but I could have done it with this. I just wanted the better camera there. And I paid this phone off, so it was already paid off. But yeah, I mean, you all have a phone, almost all of you, right? So things like that, trying to be smart with your equipment and how to do things. Um, let's see here, Psalm School Advanced. So the, this show was started off as basically a diary of uh, my video diary of my studies. And that definitely served its purpose um, for intro and certified. But really, I don't go super in depth anymore. That's more of an advanced level. So I'm gonna create a separate channel. So behind the scenes, we have a separate channel. Psalm School Advanced will be a separate channel, and it's it's meant for someone like me, or even higher. There's plenty of consumer level and intro-ish level info out there, videos and just like courses you can take either for free or or um, pay for. Mine is going to be way more in depth. The other thing is, that, and this is all gonna be free. So, so the videos will be free. Uh, the information I'll provide for each video, I'll have like flashcards. You will have to download a free program to do this. You, it's like a small upgrade for the pro version. Uh, so to get the flashcards in that format, it's not gonna be like Quizlet. Um, I'll have quizzes, I'll have notes, I'll have bibliography, like how, do you, how did I find all this information? So this is, me giving you what I'm using to study. Now, I also have a whole bunch of other stuff I've been doing the past really like six months. But um, yeah, I'm not worried about viewership. I could care less how many people watch that video. It's really just me to put it out there and go through the process of, of studying rather than just like, yeah, I'm gonna study for like two hours. No, I'm gonna study for a long time and then I have to create a video on it, right? Um, so yeah. Texom Best Sommelier Competition. So Texom, you know, I go there all the time, is in August. So again, there's no indication that they're gonna do anything with Texom as far as rescheduling or uh, canceling it. But again, with the, all the uncertainty going on, you just don't know. Anyway, my goal is to only attend Texom for the competition this year. Um, and my goal is to win it, absolutely win it. 
Now, if I get second or third, that's great. There's money involved, and that's why I want to win it, not just for the money. There's also recognition. Um, there's also a lot. It just it just also is a it's really good um, indicator where you're at for the advanced exam. Now, I've done this twice, and then I've actually taken the, the actual exam. They're really close as far as what the competition is and what the actual exam is like. There are some differences because it is a competition, so there might be some things that you would not get in the exam, but for the most part, it's the exam. <clears throat> it's, a free, it's a free look at the exam, and I've had it twice, and I've done horrible at it. This year, I'm gonna rock it, if I get to go. Um, so yeah, I'm not planning on doing my volunteer stuff, like being up there eight or nine nights. It's just go up there, you get there the day before the drive up, the day before the competition, um, and then now Tech Summit is three days long, so you're there the whole time. And the cool thing about being a, a participant in the competition is that you actually can audit the um, you can audit the seminars as long as there's space in the seminar. So that's kind of cool. And you never know, maybe I'll be bored and be like, hey, can I go polish some silverware? Uh, silverware. <laughs> I could do that. Polish some glassware um, after the competition's over. So, I mean, they'll definitely take the extra help for volunteering. Trust me, they will. But the idea is, remember this is supposed to be the year of restraint? So yeah, Oregon was the year was, was the last bit of excess for the year, for, for carryover from last year. Very expensive trip. Um, here's my chance if you, I know this is not a good time to ask for money. There's a lot more people out there that need money way more than I do. But if you have the ability to hit the PayPal link in the description on, you know, on YouTube or the website or the podcast, Send me a couple ducats, it'd be great. All right, and then um, study, 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 and I really have no plans for any major travel. I might go out into the hill country during the summertime or in the fall to um, do some interviews or just like just plain visits just to go hang out with my friends, my, tech, my Texas wine industry friends. Um, but then the other thing is I do also plan to, and this is again the first, the first like say next six, seven months, I won't be like in lockdown mode for studying, but on my days off, I have a drone. I can make money from this. So that's like a side hustle, right? It's called a side hustle instead of a side gig. So yeah, I'm looking to do that. Hey, so if you know anyone locally or within like close by of Bear County in Texas, San Antonio, and they want to hire me to do uh, drone stuff like, you know, marketing videos or something for your real estate or you just feel like having some cool stuff um surveying i don't I can't do surveying because i'm not a certified surveyor but uh, inspections uh things like that hit me up and we'll we'll figure out the cost basically be 250 dollars an hour that's like kind of a standard price anyway so yeah um so that is everything that's how i spent my quarter my q1 and um i didn't I barely drink any of this This wine is so good. And you'll know which wine it was because I had the same reaction when I tasted it. Like, so good. It's a grape that I really like. I don't drink a lot of. And those are hints. So when you get to that episode, you're like, oh, Mark was drinking that during this. So yeah, that's going to do it for uh, this episode. Uh, as always, click the links above to friend me up. I'll have a couple links below. Like, I'll have a link to the my uh, course my, value, my uh, recap of the course that I took. I'll have like a link to the Quartermaster Sommelier so you can see what that's all about. I guess that's really the only links I really need to put down. Oh, I'll put Texom down there too because they're also badasses. I love them. As a matter of fact, oh, real quick. I didn't put in my notes. But when all this stuff was going on like a couple weeks after, you know, actually after the advanced exam, I got a phone call from one of the Texom people because I went to the retreat and they just wanted to make sure I was doing okay. If they, if they, need, if they need anything, if there's anything to do for me, and I was really appreciative. Like I, I reached back to the person, then I also emailed the other people that are like the principals with Texom, and I was like, "That is awesome, you did it, and uh, I'm doing great. Thank you very much. You know, but if there's anything I need to do or can do for you or anyone else, let me know because while I can't do anything financially for anybody, I might be able to give people advice, support, or whatever. So if you are in that situation, whether you're in the industry or not. Um, I'm not saying I need, I want a ton of emails, but you know what, you know, I'll, I'll do whatever I can to help you 
and maybe like put you, point you in the right direction for something, um, give you some advice and all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, links below, PayPal's down there too. We'll see everyone again next time. Cheers.